summary of the synthesis and reactions of esters. And again, a lot of these are stuff we've already covered, so you're going to see a lot of review in here, but we're going to kind of put it all together in one convenient place so that you can organize it in your brain accordingly. Now, this lesson is part of my organic chemistry playlist. I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the school year. So if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. All right, so shocker here. We're not actually going to start with anything from this chapter. We're going to start with a reaction we learned in the last chapter on ketones and aldehydes. So, and in this one, it's the bayer villiger oxidation. So the bayer villiger oxidation oxidizes a ketone to the corresponding ester. And in this case, the reagent of choice is a peroxy acid or per acid for short. Just as a reminder, MCPBA was the most famous one. So you might just see uh, very commonly MCPBA written here. So, but what you have to remember is that we're gonna insert an oxygen on one side of the ketone. It's whichever side is more substituted. So we got a primary carbon here, a secondary carbon here. We're gonna insert it on this side here in this case. Cool, and just get the analogous ester in this case, and that's our first review for reaction for synthesizing an ester. The next ones are gonna come right from our nucleophilic acyl substitution section, our inner conversion of all the carboxylic acids and derivatives. And we can make an ester from either the acid halide or acid anhydride. So, and both of them don't need a catalyst, so you can use the corresponding just alcohol. So to get your ester or the corresponding alkoxide as well. And again, technically with your acid halide and acid anhydride, you can use uh, the alcohol with acid catalyst, but again, just not routinely done. So I didn't include it in this section. Now, those are the things that are more reactive to make your ester. So however, you can also deal with things that are equally reactive. And so here between the ester and the carboxylic acid, notice we can go back and forth. And so with the carboxylic acid, we can add the appropriate alcohol with acid catalyst. And it turns out when you start with a carboxylic acid, you, if you might recall, you have to use the acid catalyst. You can't use a base catalyst. A base catalyst would simply just deprotonate uh, your H first, turning it into a carboxylate, and you're never going to turn that carboxylate into your ester. So at least not by a way, unless we look at an alternative way in a little bit here anyways. So, but for the uh, nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction, it has to be acid catalyzed with the appropriate alcohol here. We'll pull that off. Now, it turns out if you start with a carboxylic acid, so, and add an appropriate alcohol with an acid catalyst, that has a special name. It's called the Fischer esterification. And at the end of this lesson, we're gonna go back and revisit that one and actually go through the mechanism. It is one of the more commonly tested upon mechanisms from this chapter. So we're gonna take the time to go over it, but again, at the end of this lesson. Okay, there's one other way to do this, and it's not so obviously implied by any of the reactions on this chart here. So, and there's not a great way to really represent it, but it's called trans esterification. And so here we've got kind of how to turn one, you know, carboxylic acid or derivative functional group into a different one. But trans esterification involves turning one ester into a different ester. And so how do you like have this looping around to, you know, form another ester or something like that? Not an easy way to represent it on that chart here. So but that's ultimately what we're going to do here. And so in this case, Let's say I want to take my methyl ester and turn it into an ethyl ester. So, well, in this case, I need to replace the methoxy leaving group with a new leaving group right here. Now, if you're starting with an ester, you have to do either acid or base catalysis. And so in this case, if I wanted to do base catalysis, I'd just simply add that corresponding anion. And so we just add, so ethoxide, like sodium ethoxide give a corresponding salt. So if you want to do it acid catalyzed, well then you'd add the corresponding alcohol with an acid like H2SO4. So you can do base catalysis or you can do acid catalysis. Obviously you don't need all three of these. Maybe I should put a big fat or in this, but you're just replacing the alkoxy leaving group of one ester with a different alkoxy group leading to a different ester. That's trans esterification. So Again, it's, it's not formally on this chart, and we didn't formally bring it up, so I definitely wanted to make a point of pointing it out here. All right, so the last way to make an ester here is technically something you would have learned back in first semester when we studied SN1 and SN2 reactions. So we're going to do this via SN2, and I, and I would say you would have learned it back then. It, it just would have been one of many different SN2 reactions, and you wouldn't have really thought of it in this context. So but we're going to start with the carboxylic acid. First thing we're going to do is add an NOH. And just a reminder, a carboxylic acid, you add hydroxide, it's just simply going to get deprotonated, form the corresponding carboxylate here. 
So in your carboxylate, it turns out is a moderate nucleophile, and but it's strong enough that it can actually do SN2. And I say it's moderate because it's not as strong as, say, an alkoxide where you have a negative charge localized on a single oxygen. It's resonant stabilized between two oxygens, so, but still can act as a strong nucleophile. And so if I add a good, like, methyl or primary halide, I can do SN2. So and in this case, in fact, if we draw this out, we can just come in and do backside attack, kick off the leaving group, and in this case, we've made a methyl ester. Cool, and so like I said, this would have been a reaction we learned back in first semester. We just wouldn't technically have associated it with like making an ester and stuff like that, which is why we're reviewing it here. So now we'll talk about the reactions of esters, and these are all going to be review in one way, shape, or form. So a couple nuances, though, you definitely need to know. And so if we look, the first are going to come right off this chart with nucleophilic acyl substitution. And the one thing I want to point out, we already brought up transesterification in the synthesis of an ester, but we should also realize that because you're turning an ester into an ester, not only is your product an ester, but your reactant is an ester. And so transesterification is also a reaction of esters. And so the key is if you want to do transesterification and turn one ester into another, you you just have to add the appropriate alkoxide ion to your reactant ester to make the product ester, or you have to add the appropriate alcohol with acid to get there as well. So it can be acid or base catalyzed. So just a you know quick realization that transesterification is a synthesis and a reaction of esters. Cool. Now, to, uh, otherwise, to make an ester off here, you got to start with one of the more reactive, either acyl halides or in hydrides. And again, you could do those uncatalyzed with the appropriate alcohol to get your new alkoxy leaving group, or you could do it base catalyzed as well. Now, again, there's nothing that says you can you can't do it acid catalyzed. I'll keep harping on this. It's just not routinely how we'll do it. That's so why I didn't include it on your sheet there. Now, you can also make an ester. Uh, start with an ester to make your carboxylic acid, and in this case, you can't just do it with water. So, whereas the acyl halides and anhydrides will react with water to make a carboxylic acid, you need ester-based catalysis here. And so, in this case, to make the carboxylic acid, you're going to need H3O plus to make your carboxylic acid, and then base catalyzed hydroxide would make your carboxylate. And so, that's a review of the nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions we saw uh, back earlier in this chapter. Let's take a look and review reactions with organometallics. All right, so organometallics here. Uh, pretty much the only thing you got to worry about your ester reacting with is your Grignard, because we're going to see in a second that it's not going to actually react with a Gilman reagent. No organocuprate reaction here. So, uh, and with your Grignard here, you're just going to replace your leaving group, in this case the methoxy group, with whatever the carbanion equivalent of your Grignard is. In this case, a methyl group. And this is just an intermediate, though. So here we form a ketone. So. And the key is we're going to add excess Grignard, and so it's going to keep reacting with this guy. And so you got another equivalent of the Grignard, and then your acid workup step, which might be water or H3O+, depending on what textbook you're looking at, gets you your tertiary alcohol. Now, you might ask me, Chad, what if we try to add only one equivalent of our Grignard so that we can stop here? Well, it turns out, in particular with the ester, it's not going to work out well. Now, with an acid chloride or an hydride, you might pull it off. So, and I didn't formally present that either, but here you're definitely not going to pull it off. And the idea is that when your Grignard reacts with your ester, it turns it into a ketone, but your product ketone can then react with the Grignard to make the alcohol. Well, the problem in this specific case is that your ketone is actually more reactive. It's a better electrophile than your ester. So say you had 10, you know, esters equivalents and 10 Grignard equivalents. And by the time the first five react, you've created five ketones, but you still have five Grignards left and five esters left. And those five Grignards look and be like, oh, I can react with five of these, or we can react with the ketones we just made. And they would decide to just, just react with the ketones you just made and make the alcohol. And so you'd have half of your ester left over. And so no great way, especially with the ester, to add only one equivalent and end up with the ketone here. You got to go excess and go all the way here. Even if you decide not to go excess, this is still going to be your major product. You're just going to have a lot of leftover reactants as well. Let's take a look at hydride reduction for esters too. So our first hydride reduction was with lithium aluminum hydride. And keep in mind now that esters are not reactive enough to react with sodium borohydride. So the acid chlorides work, the anhydrides work, ketones and aldehydes work, which kind of right in between in reactivity as far as they are uh, uh, electrophiles between anhydrides and esters. But by the time you get down to an ester, so these guys, esters, carboxylic acids, amides, they're not going to react with sodium borohydride. So we had to use lithium aluminum hydride here.
So in the first equivalent of lithium hydride is going to replace our methoxy leaving group of the ester here, alkoxy group, with a hydrogen. So, but you can't stop there because aldehydes react even more so with lithium aluminum hydride. And so you'll keep going and add another hydride ion across and then eventually protonate in the acid workup step to get your primary alcohol. So we're gonna make primary alcohols here. Now, if you do wanna stop at halfway, just like with acyl halides and anhydrides, we have a special reducing agent for this. So, but it's not the tritert butoxy aluminum hydride this time, it's dibod, diisobutyl aluminum hydride. Instead, that's specific for esters here. And this will stop you at one equivalent so that you can actually get the aldehyde product. Cool, and that is a review of your hydride reductions. Now let's take a look at one last reaction. So that'll have some biochemical context and that is saponification, let's take a look. Now before we talk about saponification is actually formally something we've presented, we just didn't recognize it by the name saponification here. So, but if you take an ester and add hydroxide, so you take an ester and you add hydroxide, you'll get the corresponding carboxylate. Well, it turns out that's ultimately what saponification is, is the basic hydrolysis of an ester to produce not only a carboxylate, but also a corresponding uh, alcohol as well. And so in this case, it turns out this is the bond we're going to break right here. And it turns out when this initially happens, once again, you'll get the OH replacing it. So, but then you'd also form this methoxide ion here. So, and the methoxide would come and deprotonate that hydrogen because he's a strong base and he's an okay acid and end up with a resonance stabilized anion instead. Cool, so you get a carboxylate and an alcohol at the end of base catalyzed hydrolysis of an ester. Well, it turns out if you do this with specifically uh, a fat, and we'll call it a fat here, so, uh, but here we've got a triglyceride. A triglyceride has a glycerol backbone, which is one, two, three propane triol, so one, two, three carbons, with a place for an alcohol on all three. It's not an alcohol in this case, it's in ester linkages. This is your triglyceride, and it's got three ester linkages, and with three ester linkages, we're gonna break this bond, we're gonna break this bond and we're gonna break this bond when we do basic hydrolysis. And so instead of getting one carboxylate and one alcohol, we're gonna get three different carboxylates and then a triol in the middle here. So let's take a look at the products here if we predict this. So we've got, first off, glycerol is gonna be a product here. That's our triol from the middle here. And then we'll get the corresponding carboxylates here. So we'll get well, let's draw them the way they're reflected here. So R1, so R2, and then finally R3. Cool, notice I've made R1, R2, and R3 all different. So, but depending on what triglyceride you're talking about, they could all three be the same, or two could be the same, or they could all three be different as I've represented here. It really depends on the triglyceride. I'm just generically showing you the saponification reaction. So, but I really wanted to make sure you realize that this was exactly the same thing as base catalyzed hydrolysis. It's just happening three times within the same molecule. So now we wanna briefly go back and take a look at that mechanism for the Fischer esterification. So, and once again, Fischer esterification, uh, you start with the carboxylic acid and add the corresponding correct alcohol with an acid catalyst here. And if you look here, what's going on in our nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction here is that we're gonna form water from these two H's in the O there, and then we'll have the alkoxy group replacing that OH in the final product. And so keeping track with the different colors here, We're gonna form an ester. So, and then we'll form a water where the OH came from the carboxylic acid and one of the H's came from the corresponding alcohol here. All right, so if we take a look at the mechanism here, so when you put an alcohol in acid, just like when you put a water in acid, when water in acid, you get H3O plus. Well, this is analogous to H3O plus. Instead of protonated water, it's just protonated alcohol. So. And when you're doing an acid catalyzed reaction with an alcohol, that's your acidic species you're gonna use every time you need an acid. And once again, we've also got an alcohol in this solution. Plenty of that as well. So, but an alcohol is a weak nucleophile and a weak nucleophile is not gonna attack the carbonyl here, or the carboxyl group 
uh, of a carboxylic acid. We've got to make this thing more reactive. And so the first step, so this will be a classic acid catalyzed mechanism. So I uh, just want to give you another example and give you one of the more common examples you're likely to see here. So, but just like we did with a typical acid catalyzed mechanism is we're going to protonate the oxygen here first. and make this thing an even stronger electrophile. And so once again, we had a pretty decent dipole moment here for this carbon oxygen bond, but now we have a pretty significantly stronger dipole moment, much more partial positive charge on that carbon. And whereas the alcohol is not gonna react with this partially positive carbon to any significant extent, it can totally react with that one instead. And so now we can have our alcohol come do nucleophilic attack. In fact, I actually formed another equivalent of the alcohol here. So I could have had it acting as the reactant as well. Oh, and as we've seen, equilibrium all the way through. All right, gets us here. So this OH right here is now this OH right here, and that OH is still that OH. And now we've attached the alcohol. That positively charged oxygen is the most reactive part of our molecule. So and technically it's a good leaving group, but I don't want it to leave. We just added it. And as we saw, if you just added something that's currently still a good leaving group and you want it to stay, deprotonate it. And that's what we're gonna do. And so in this case, we'll draw in another alcohol molecule. And he'll be our base anytime we need a base in this mechanism. That's going to create another one of our protonated alcohols here. Uh, and in this case, there's nothing particularly reactive about this molecule. So we just got to keep in mind where we're trying to head here. And, and in this case, this OH is not going to be part of our final product here when we get an ester here. And so it's not a good leaving group right now being an OH, but we can protonate it to make it one. And that's what we're going to do. And again, our protonated alcohols are acid when we need one. All right, and just like we talked about when we talked about the acid catalyzed mechanism, if you protonate something to make a good leaving group, you are definitely gonna have it leave in the very next step. So, and just like we showed then as well, instead of showing the carbocation that we might get here, it's gonna be resonant stabilized, and technically it'll actually be resonant stabilized in both oxygens, but oftentimes you'll see, instead of all the resonant structures being drawn out, just the most convenient one, uh, one of the major resonance contributors with this guy, and we'll see why it's the most convenient one here in a sec. So form some water there as well. And then to get to our final ester product, all we gotta do is deprotonate this guy. And once again, we wanna deprotonate, just draw in an alcohol molecule or use the one from the previous step either way. We get our acid catalyst, acid catalyst regenerated at the end here as well. Cool, and that's your mechanism. And as true to form, this should be six steps. So we got one, two, three, four, five, and six steps. As we've seen a, a very common pattern emerging for a lot of these acid catalyzed mechanisms. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? Best thing you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for practice problems on carboxylic acids and their derivatives, check out my premium course at chadsprep.com.